multiple crimes, there was, as the prosecution originally put, a grand design. Basically what they said was that this was a basic JCE one. Every crime committed in that four year period, 96 to 2000, was intended by the accused. Really quite far-fetched when you think about it, in a country where you don't know, there's no way of knowing what someone is doing down the road. There are no mobile phones, no communication. There was no sophisticated hierarchy in the RUF. Um, so they decided that there was this one basic common purpose. Everything was intended. The difficulty with Bao's case was that when they looked at all of the crimes that he'd been implicated with, they could only find one which they found that he had intended. <coughs> the rest of the crimes, particularly in other areas of the country where he didn't live, he used to live in this little area here, Kailan. Crimes in Bo, crimes in Kenema, crimes up in Kono. The trial chamber, having said that the common plan was basic JCE, everybody intends every crime. They then, having decided that on one hand, but on the other hand, said, well, as far as Bauer is concerned, all right, he didn't intend these, but they were reasonably foreseeable. In, all, in other words, they used mens rea of JCE 3, the reasonably foreseeable test, to convict him of crimes that they'd already decided were JCE 1, the basic intent, the basic form. They collapsed the distinction between the two. Now, unfortunately, <coughs> that was, or the result of that, was that Bao was found liable for every single crime in those regions that I've mentioned, despite the fact that he hadn't intended them, and actually on the facts couldn't properly have been said to have reasonably foreseen them either. Essentially, what it came down to was this. He was found to be part of a common purpose to commit crimes where those crimes were largely intended by the participants. When, by the same token, the trial chamber elsewhere in their judgment came to the conclusion that he himself didn't intend to commit them at all. It was dreadfully contradictory and wrong. The second mistake was on the facts. Let's just go back to those ingredients again, Actus Reus. You have to show he made a significant contribution to the common plan. If any of these ingredients are not fulfilled, the whole thing fails. But in, in relation to the significant contribution, the court found that Bao was the chief ideologist of the RUF, which was strange because not a single witness in three years said as much, and the prosecution never led that either in their initial pleadings. They made it up. And this brought hot dispute from Judge Gutti. When it got to the appeal chamber, unfortunately, the appeal chamber sided with the majority in the trial chamber. But again, it was only on majority, it was three to two. And Mrs. Justice Fisher, um, an American judge who came quite late into the uh, RUF trial, um, delivered a withering dissent, condemning, really, the way in which the trial chamber and the majority of the appeal chamber had twisted the rules of JC, JC around. The way they had used the mens rea of JCE3 in order to convict Bao of an offence which was supposedly JCE1. In other words, <coughs> finding that he only finding only that he could have reasonably foreseen crimes as the requisite mens rea for JC one where you had to prove that those crimes were intended. Foreseeability doesn't come into it. That's what I mean by collapsing the distinction. I know this is all a bit academic and complicated, but believe me, it was a lot worse for me at the time, because this was a departure in the law. During the appeal hearings, the prosecutor had the nerve to stand up and say, well, yes, I accept there is no precedent 
for this jurisprudence. There is no precedent for the argument we are positing. We accept this has no foundation in law. As Simon Cowell said on the X Factor the other night, it was a stitch up. And that's what it was. And if you can imagine in my shoes, after five years, knowing that the only two incidents that your client has been found to have personally been involved in were the aiding and abetting of a slapping in the face of a UN peacekeeper and then him being bundled off in the boot of someone's car. And I'm not exaggerating. This is the truth. And the other one was planning some incidents of forced labour in Kailan district, where his little fiefdom was. This place was under siege from CDF and UN forces in 1999. People were starving here. Forced labour had to be, uh, or organised labour had to be um, provided for. There was no food. Those were the only two things he was actually found to have committed in the whole war, but he got 25 years in respect to the following offences. Extermination, murder, rape, sexual slavery, forced marriage, enslavement, acts of terrorism, collected punishments, mutilation, pillage, intentionally directing attacks against United Nations peacekeepers none of which he committed. Mrs. Justice Fisher said this. Uh, the division in the appeal chamber was three to two. The trial chamber's error with respect to Bowers men's rare, she's referring to the collapsed distinction between JC1 and JC3, is not simply a harmless mistake that can be rectified or overlooked on appeal. Rather, because of this error, the entire legal edifice, the trial chamber, the majority have constructed for Bow's joint criminal enterprise liability, is so fundamentally flawed that those convictions that rest on it collapse. She went on, for Bow, the trial chamber and the majority have abandoned the safeguards laid down by other tribunals as reflective of international, of customary, <coughs> customary international law. As a result, Bauer stands convicted of committing crimes which he did not intend, to which he did not significantly contribute, and which were not a reasonably foreseeable consequence <coughs> of the crimes that he did intend. The majority's decision, it's the appeal chamber majority's decision, to uphold these convictions is regrettable. I can only hope that the primary significance of that decision will be as a reminder of the burden resting on trials of fact, applying JCE, and as a warning of the unfortunate consequences that ensue when they fail to carry out that burden. In international criminal tribunals, to accuse should not be to condemn. One of the things that I found most consoling during this trial <coughs> was that we in this country stand alone in terms of how we conduct ourselves about our job. We really are the best. And I'm not just talking about forensic ability in the court. Uh, and I have a, a good deal of experience of people with whom I can compare myself and other people from this jurisdiction. Not just talking about our forensic ability, not just talking about our commitment. Above all else, let me tell you, I'm talking about our ethics, because our ethics are way and above the ethics of any other jurisdiction that I came across, and they came from all over the world in this tribunal. And so I was very proud of that. Um, it was a frustrating time for me. The reason I stayed on as long as I did was to try and make it as difficult for the prosecution and this very partial tribunal to get what they wanted, to fill in the blanks, to tell that political story that was so preordained in the Office of Legal Affairs in the UN. Uh, and that's why I stayed there. To a large extent, I like to think that we succeeded because to get 25 years, when you know really deep down that all the guy did was plan a bit of forced labour, 
and assist someone being slapped in the face is a pretty pyrrhic victory. Sorry, it got a bit, a bit a little bit complicated. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.